I'm Val, or if you insist on the full name, it's Val Trout. Um, the research I'm presenting has been conducted at UCL as well, so staying within <laughs> the same university. But since then, I've moved on. I'm now at the University of Warwick for my PhD. So the study I'm presenting was, as I said, conducted as part of my MSc degree, which makes it slightly more small <coughs> scale than the project that Erin just presented. And hopefully I'll be able to expand on it at some later stage, but for now, unfortunately, it has been put on hold. So the, what I'm presenting now could probably be considered more like a pilot project for a future larger one. It has recently been published in New Forensic Science International as well. If you're interested in some more detail, you can go there, you'll find more more detail on the documentation method I'm presenting and more on the technical side that I'm not dwelling too much on today. So I'm going to start with introducing the main aspects of uh, my project, the method, the experimental setup and the results, followed by discussion of the benefits and the wider applications of the methods, and finally some concluding remarks and a future outlook of the project and the method. So as you can see, the title of what I'm presenting is the application of structure for motion as a documentation tool in, a for in forensic archaeology and beyond, a long bulky title <coughs> and focusing on the method structure for motion. Now I'm pretty sure not everyone has come across this, so I'll be starting by explaining this, this method. I'll try to keep it short and focus more on the applications, which is the essential part of the project. Structure for motion is sometimes also referred to as 3D photogrammetry, maybe people have heard of that instead, but I'll be just sticking to structure for motion or shortened as FFM for this talk, just to be consistent and not confused. It is a method that can be used to capture either an individual small object or an entire scene outdoors in three dimensions. Now this is achieved by taking a series of still images, just ordinary photographs, which are then computed into a three-dimensional model. It's a pretty straightforward process, to be honest. Um, all you need is a camera, a computer and the relevant software, and the latter is available as predominantly freeware, there is a few options that you can pay, but compared to other softwares, in, uh, they're fairly cheap. In other terms of equipment, it's fairly flexible, any sort of digital camera will do, even your mobile phone could work if it's got a decent enough resolution, because that is going to affect the, the outcome in the end. And depending on the size of the of the images and the overall files that you collect. You can even run it on your laptop. You don't even need a high spec computer for that. So in the field it works by acquiring the photos while moving around the scene. So basically let's say an archaeological trench you just move around it and take photos at different angles, diff different elevations. Or if you take just a small object, you can just rotate the object. It is important for the entire process that you have some overlap between the images, because this is essentially how the software then later on detects the image, image points. So yeah, as I mentioned already, it, the most essential factor for the overall uh, quality of the project is always the initial image quality. So once all the photographs are taken, you upload them to the relevant software. What I've used in this project was Adisoft's PhotoScan. It's decently cheap for, for software terms. Um, we had it at the Institute, other freeware options are equally good. It's, it's just every software comes with their own advantages, disadvantages. 
some are more complicated than others. Azizov focus down is fairly straightforward to use. It tells, it guides you through every step you have to do, and it's, it's foolproof basically. So you can that in the bottom there that all your photos that you've uploaded. You can see them here as well, and what the software then does is uh, tracking distinctive features within every image that you've uploaded. That's like edges, corners, where there's a distinctive difference visible in the pixels. So it tracks those and it uses those to al and align each photograph, so basically stitching one photograph to the next in the sequence and that creates the scene geometry and results in what you can see here, the so-called sparse point cloud. That is, you can, well you probably can't read it, close to 200,000 points for this, it's an image set of about 100 pictures. You can start seeing the outline of the scene you're looking at, still not a perfect depiction though. So what the software then does, it, it tracks the exe files from the images, which is basically the embedded information files in every picture you take, is what, what you get displayed when you click on image properties. Um, those files hold information on uh, camera make and model, the aperture, uh, ISO values, all those information, and the software takes that information to recreate the image, uh, the camera positions from where the pictures were taken. So you can see that here are those blue rectangles. That is all the pictures, all the locations from where the images were taken. And once it's done that, it tracks more image points that might not be visible in as many images as the initial ones. So most software require about two or each point to be visible in about two or three images. So using the camera locations we can then add more points to it, make it more detailed, resulting in a dense point cloud. So you can see we've added some more details. We filled in a lot of the points. You can it looks much more like the real life thing. Just see a few images of a bit closer up. You can still see it's just a pointer, so you've got holes throughout, but you can clearly see the object that's been captured and rotating it. You've got a few more angles. You can see it's a, it, this is the actual 3D model of it. So, this is essentially what you get from a laser scan as well. The only difference is because this method is pixel based, so it uses the, also the pixel colour information, you've already got the colour added to it. Most laser scans might now have uh, integrated cameras as well, but this is the point plus the colour information. So what you can then do on that uh, model, you can georeference it. You see those yellow circles that we've placed around it. What we've done is Use, uh, measuring all those points with the GPS and you can then enter the coordinates in the software, pick the points that you've measured and you then get the arrows here and basically to your reference it you can or you can just if you don't have a GPS on you can just take a reference measurement on the scene. You won't be able to georeference it but you can still scale it accurately. From there, you can also create a mesh, a solid mesh for whatever applications you might need it for. So this is the mesh only, that is just the surface model. And then you can add texture to that and you can clearly see how much detail, how li real like that theme. Yeah, you can see even the smallest details on the mesh. Now the method has been around for some time, but it's only within the last decade or so that it's really picked up. 
because of increasing computer power. So now everyone is able to run those programs and do not just in, in computer science labs. And since then, it's found quite a lot of applications ranging from architecture, geology, heritage studies in general, all those sorts of disciplines. One of the disciplines that I find has benefit pro probably the most is definitely archaeology because as I don't need to tell you all, one of the fundamental principles of archaeology is to establish a three-dimensional context of the objects and the features to establish the provenance and the relationships on site uh, which is basically the reason we do all the surveying and recording on, on site but there's still a tendency to visualize all that three-dimensional data on 2D, image, uh, 2D mediums like plans and drawings and just regular photographs. So I think it's just a natural progression that we move on to visualizing that excavation data in 3D now that we're actually able to do so. So with regards to this session, I'm focusing on a specific kind of uh, excavation being the excavation of mass graves. Therefore, kind of crossing the line from archaeology into forensics and crime scene investigations. Um, there, there are close links between the overall aims of archaeology and criminal investigations, basically trying to find out as much as possible about a past event by studying what's left of it. Uh, therefore, the three-dimensional provenance and relationship of pieces of evidence isn't only relevant to archaeology. So, in order to demonstrate the potential of SFM for the forensic investigation of mass graves, we set up a small study to recreate the process. So, I'll briefly describe the setup before I continue to present the results and go on to the discussion of them. So. Because of obvious ethical and practical issues, we couldn't perform our study on a real mass grave. Uh, so we replicated the mock gra grave. Uh, you've seen some images of it before. So we had six plastic teaching skeletons, one of them right there, which we placed in a rectangular hole. In, and in order to create more volume, more depth to the scene, we've just basically stacked them one on top of each other, covered each with a layer of soil, and then covered the whole thing over to excavate it using the standard excavation methods and protocols. So basically, we uncovered one skeleton at a time, recorded it, removed it, moved on to the next one, and so on until we uh, hit the bottom. Only that the recording that we did in this case was just the image acquisition for the structure for motion process. So the result of that is six individual point clouds for each skeleton. And then as I've shown you previously, uh, we've georeferenced the whole scene just to be able to take accurate measurements on it. Now, obviously, this isn't the perfect representation of the majority of mass graves, but we felt that for the purpose of our study, given the limitations, it was sufficient. So, what I'm going to show you a little clip now, which is just a screen recording of me moving and manipulating the final 3D model. It's a bit hesitant in the, because the, the files are quite large so bear with me it's not the most refined uh, animation <coughs> but we can zoom in that's the top view from created from the model so you can zoom in rotate the model done something with the dimensions of it here. Um, yeah, basically we can rotate the model. That is the top skeleton as we well, once we've uncovered it, I've not recorded uh, the scene to start with. This is just rotating, showing 
that is actual a 3D model. You can choose any kind of angle you would wish. And then we're basically removing one layer at a time, going down stratigraphically. Showing all the, the individuals that we've replicated down to the last one. And that's because of we georeference the scene, it automatically stacks them in the right position, so we don't that that is an accurate depiction of the actual scene without us manipulating and moving things around. So that is basically the bottom skeleton and what we've done next is cleaned up the individual point clouds to to remove all the, the soil and everything around to just show the original position of each each individual to, relevant to each other. You can see it here basically reversing the steps we've taken before. I'll just leave that running for now. It's it is very slow because it is, it is a large file. But what we can do with the model, we can take measurements from any point that we if we would wish, like every small detail, of just the regular measurements you would take in any archaeological excavation, basically. So and that brings me over to the actual uses and benefits of this method, which isn't just visualizing the scene. Now, as I just mentioned, distance measurements are one of the greatest benefits. If one, for whatever reason, needs to revisit the scene, verify measure, measurement, all that sort of thing, in real life, it is very likely that the scene will, will, will be vanished by then. It's, it's going to be gone. So you can, as shown here, you can just take the actual measurement right there. Now this is particularly useful, I think, if you've got a large scene, if you've got a complex scene where maybe objects obstructing your view, like buildings, trees, in real life, it is difficult to take measurements there. So if you take the measurements on the scale 3D model instead, it's much easier. Other studies have used GIS mapping, distance mapping between individuals and objects within the grave just to sh show the relationship, both spatial and temporal relationship between them. That's another thing that could be facilitated by those sort of models. You can just simply take dim dimensional measurements within 3D space. What you might have picked up on the, the sides of that grave there is the some tool marks that we that we created unintentionally um, when we dug the hole. So that's another thing. Like, in the mask room, you might be you might encounter tool marks, basically mainly like mechanical diggers that might have been used to create a grave. Those can be picked up on the model. That's that the all over again. So don't be distracted by that. Yeah, measurements and and tool marks can be taken on on the actual model and what we can do with it as well is using reverse engineering software to basically create a virtual cast of it. And I'm w working on a different project with the West Midlands police right now and the overall consensus amongst the FSI is that the traditional casting methods they use with like the plaster or resin cast are very prone to failure and, and the success rate isn't exactly great. So using that method instead and creating a virtual cast can basically only improve this sort of evidence. Now, apart from those analytical benefits, other further practical as aspects that make SFM very handy technique to use is the data acquisition in the field is pretty rapid. It took us about 10 minutes to acquire a set of images. It's just the processing of time that has to be taken into account. But you can quickly record things on scene, which is often uh, very, very useful, especially mass graves. There's a lot of 
external pressure, be it political, to, well, to finish your job uh, as soon as possible. And also, you're dealing with decaying material, so the sooner you get it recorded and get out of there again, the better. Plus, SFM is very cheap, as I mentioned. The things you need, everyone has a camera, everyone has a computer. Most of the software is available for free, so it's a very low cost but very highly efficient method. Now, what I've presented so far, the, the benefits, they were quite specific to mass grave investigations, which, as said before, sort of occupies the space between archaeology and crime scene investigations. So, if we move entirely into the realm of police work, the question is whether SFM can be applied here as well. And if so, how? Well, the answer would be yes. Yes, it can be literally translated one-to-one. -one. It's all the benefits and applications I've mentioned so far definitely can be used in regular police work as well. And one thing where it's especially true is the lack of resources. Police forces across the country, they're, for, uh, they're forced to reduce their spending, their spending cuts never never ending um, and police are required to provide better value for money service as it's always termed and but at the same time they're expected to keep up with technological advances just to basically maintain their credibility and accountability in the eyes of the public so SFM being a very low cost method but highly technical could be just something to live up to those requirements. Now, with regards to the benefits, all of them are relevant to uh, domestic crime scenes as well, albeit probably more the serious crimes. No one would apply that sophisticated methods to volume crime. That's that's like, for example, the distance measurements or just the dimensional aspect of creating a three-dimensional scene. You could, for example, establish line of sights. If you have a witness statement saying they saw something, you can then verify on the 3D model, well, is that actually possible? Could they see that direction or was there something obstructing their view? Another thing, as mentioned, tool mark impressions. They might not be the most common thing encountered on crime scenes, but you'll have, still have footprints and tire impressions. And what I've just mentioned about the reverse engineering and casting, it, that absolutely implies there as well. And there is yet another thing that why having such a 3D model might be a really, really good option that I've not touched upon yet. It's creating a visualization for court presentations. Now, if you show the judge and the jury a 3D model of the scene that you found your evidence in and present your evidence in 3D space, that makes it much easier to understand in the end. And what is more important to a fair trial that the judge and the jury you make the decision actually understand the evidence. So I'll just stop that there. Right, so I hope in this small study I've provided you with an example of how a technology can be used in the overall criminal justice process, not just for visualization but also for analysis, both at the scene and later on. Now I absolutely acknowledge that the study I present is by no means uh, comprehensive or covers the full uh, aspect of three-dimensional recording or mass grave investigations, but and there still is a wealth of issues that need to be addressed, addressed before you can actually routinely employ this method. There is the most pressing concern is the data security, which is needs to be considered. You can always create large amounts of data, but you have to consider what you're going to do with it afterwards. So you need secure storage for your data and like a data management system. And as I said when I uh, 
showed that little clip, the files can be quite large. So that needs to be taken into account. So you need to know what you're doing with the data you gather before you actually do it. And the other thing that definitely needs to be worked on is how to incorporate the image acquisition and the processing time perfectly with the overall documentation and investigation process. You don't want to have a new technology that just gets in your way all the time. So once we've worked out these problems, which hopefully can be addressed in further studies of that kind, I think it's a much more feasible alternative to methods like laser scanning and I absolutely understand why it's up and coming in archaeology and it's only logical to have it in other investigative processes as well. Thank you very much.